Section 2.3, Stem and Leaf Diagrams. In the previous sections, we looked at grouping and graphing data. In this section, we're going to look at a new type of graph called a stem and leaf diagram. And this one actually accomplishes both of those goals simultaneously for some data sets. It groups the data and it graphs it all at once. And in addition to that, it also puts the data in order. And in addition to that, unlike grouping and graphing we've seen in the past, it maintains contact with the raw data as well. So let me go ahead and show you how it works with an example. The following data were obtained for the number of students taking the final for a sample of 40 math classes. So we went out, we randomly sampled 40 math classes. We showed up on the day of the final and we looked in to see how many people were there to take the final. In one class it was 31 students in another one. It was 23 and so on and we have 40 different classes there. So that's the raw data and in part A they want us to construct a stem and leaf diagram for that data. So the way that works is we take these two digit numbers and we break them up into two parts, a stem and a leaf. And the tens place will become the stem and the ones place will become the leaf. So for example that 31 is right here. There's the three and there's the one. So to the left of this line we have the stems. And in this, in this case, that would be the tens place, and that's the standard. And then on the other side over here, we have the leaves. And that would typically be the ones place. So all the numbers in the 20s and 30s have been done. So this would represent the tens, where we have this one right here. So we're going to go through, and we're going to look for numbers that start with that one, and we're going to put them on this line. So just kind of scanning through the data, looking for that lead digit of a one. There's one with the 19. So the 1 for the 19 is already there, so we just need to put the 9 right here. And then we have a 14 and a 16, so we'll add those in as well by writing the 4 and 6 on the 1's line. The other thing I want to point out real quick before we get too deep into this is that because this is going to be a graph, we don't want it to be misleading, and that means we need consistent spacing. And so the graph grid behind this is there so that we can line up the numbers and make sure that they all use the same amount of space. So be careful when you write them down. Really think about trying to line them up with the numbers above and below and have them as best as you can right in the center of the square. So continuing on, we have 15 and 16. So we put the 5 and the 6, and then 10, 15, and 17. So a 0, a 5, and a 7. And 14, 16, 18, so we have a 4 and a 6 and an 8. And I believe that finishes off all the numbers that start with a 1 or in the 10s class. We also have um, a line here for anything in the 40s. So looking for that real quick, I see a 42 right there. And that, if you scan through the data set, is the only number in the 40s. So if I put the 2 here, then I have the 40 from the stems part and the 2 from the leaf, so 42. So that's the basics of how you would make a stem and leaf diagram. And I said that we're grouping the data and graphing it. The grouping part is in that we put things into the 10s, the 20s, the 30s, and the 40s. The graphing is that these numbers right here, the leaves, are forming like histogram bars. So if I turn this sideways, then we can kind of think of it as like this is the number line with this line right here and then the, the leaves are forming the bars and so you've got that kind of histogram sort of look. Alright, so there's the basics of it, but there's a couple adjustments that we want to make. One of them is I said that a stem and leaf diagram orders the data and right now we only have the data roughly ordered. It's in the 10s, 20s, 30s, 40s, so it's in order in that sense, but it goes 19, 14, 16, 15, 16, so that's not really in order. So we need to remedy that. And that's going to be in part B where we construct an ordered stem and leaf diagram. And generally that's the goal all the time. That'll be your directions is to construct an ordered stem and leaf diagram. Um, but it's kind of a difficult task sometimes to go straight there. Putting data in order can be a pain. So when people do that, they usually look for the smallest number, the next smallest number, and the next smallest number, and so on. And the trouble with that, if you've ever tried it before, is you often end up missing something and then you tend to kind of want to jam it in and say, oh, I missed something, let me squeeze it in right here. But if you do that on a stem and leaf diagram, you're ruining the spacing and that means you're making a misleading graph. So sometimes just as scratch work, it's a good idea just to do this quick stem and leaf where you've separated it into 10s, 20s, 30s, 40s. 
and then you can finish it off and make it ordered by just ordering the leaves, which generally, because they're one digit numbers, happens really fast. So that's been done here already, um, zero through nine, and zero through nine, and zero through three, but going in order for the leaves now. So now the entire data set is in order, and this is generally the goal, is to get to this point. And this is what probably will be the first set of directions you get, is to create that. If the data is in order, go straight there. If the data is not in order, I would suggest um, possibly doing something like constructing this stem and leaf diagram as a scratch and then go to here to accomplish the goal. All right, so now we've got an ordered stem and leaf diagram, but there's still one problem with this. If you just count how many classes we've done in terms of our groupings, we have the 10s, 20s, 30s, 40s. That's only four classes. And we said in previous sections that when we're grouping data, we like to have between five and 20 classes. So one way that you can accomplish that when you don't have enough classes with your basic stem and leaf diagram is to create a stem and leaf diagram using two lines per stem. When you do that, you're taking each one and breaking it into kind of a lower and upper. So the class for the 20s becomes lower 20s and upper 20s. And we make the split there in the same way that we would if we were doing rounding. So 4 and down goes in the lower 20s, and 5 and up go in the upper 20s. So if we go to do that here, the 0, 4, 4 would go in the lower 10s. So we'd put the 10, the 14, and the 14 on this line. And then anything from 15 up would go on the next line. So we have a couple 5s, 3 6s, 6s. And then seven, eight, nine. And then lower 20s, upper 20s, lower 30s, upper 30s, lower 40s, and it would be upper 40s. So there's the two lines per stem. I just mentioned there that, you know, is it really two lines per stem? Because we only have one four. The reason that's being done is one of the rules with grouping data is that you really shouldn't start or end with an empty class. So because there was nothing in the upper 40s, I left that off. And then it's okay and actually necessary to have an empty class here because we want to be able to see that having 42 students take the final is a little bit unusual and seeing that there's a gap between it and the next closest numbers actually helps to emphasize that. So if you have an empty class in the middle, you should show it so that people can see if this is a bit of an outlier. Uh, but if there's an empty class at the beginning and the end, it's best to leave that off. All right, now for some follow-ups to that. Let's do what they want in part D here, which is to write out the class descriptions for part B. So here was our finished product, and we had 10s, 20s, 30s, 40s, but what are the actual class descriptions? So what you want to think about is where does that class start at 10, and where does it go to? And it went up to 19 in terms of what's included there, but really when you're doing class descriptions, you're thinking about what's the largest that could have been included there. So how about like 19.99 or something? Well, this data was actually discrete because it was the number of students taking the final, which can only be a whole number. So the largest thing that could have been on that class is 19. And because it is discrete data, I would use the through symbol. When you're asked to write out class descriptions, you always have to go back and look to see what was the data about to see if it's continuous through less than 20 or discrete and do the through 19 sort of situation. And then just continuing on, we have 20 through 29. 30 through 39, and then sometimes in class people will say 40 through 42 or something like that, or maybe even 30 through 33 just because of what's in the class. But class descriptions are supposed to list what could be on the class, not what actually is in the class. And if we had something as large as 49, it still would have gone on this line. So we're supposed to reflect that when we write the class descriptions. Now when we broke it into two lines per stem, we said we were doing lower and upper. So now instead of that first line going all the way to 19, it just would go to 14, and then we would have 15 through 19, and so on. And just like we should show that empty class, we should list it as well. So 35 through 39 really was one of the classes in the stem and leaf diagram. It just happened to be empty. And then on this last one, even though we only had one of them, if it's two lines per stem, they should be equal width. So this one should be 40 through 44 because it should just represent the lower 40s. And then we don't need to list the 45 through 49 because we didn't put that one on the graph. And then just a few notes to finish this off. When you're drawing a stem and leaf diagram, 
you have to draw the vertical line. You can't just imagine it. You can't just think to yourself, okay, this line right here is going to be where I separate them. You have to draw it in so that people can see it like a number line. And note two, the spacing of the numbers must be done carefully and consistently so the graph does not become misleading. So really kind of focus when you're done and look at these vertically and think, do these all line up? It's nice if you have graph paper to make sure the spacing is consistent. Graph paper is not required in the homework, but make sure that if you don't have graph paper, you're making a careful effort to use about the same amount of space between each number. And then finally, note three, the leaves must always be only one digit, but they can represent any place, ones, tens, tenths, etc. If the leaf unit is not the ones place, then this should be stated in your work, and the stems can be more than one digit if needed. So let me just kind of discuss a few hypotheticals with this one. So if you look at a stem and leaf and there's no notation about it, you should assume this is tens and this is ones, and therefore a number like this seven on the two line would be 27. But if there was a note that said the leaf unit represents the tenths place, then I would think, all right, if this is the tenths place, then that's a 0.7. And then this must be one place to the left, which would be the ones place. And then this would be a 2.7. So we might do that if these were grade points or something. And speaking of grade point averages, say you had a grade point average like 2.79. And we said that this was going to be a graph for that and that the leaf unit represented the tenths. Then if you did that and you had a 2.79, it would go as a 2 and a 7. Not a 2 as an 8, you wouldn't round it, um, because that could actually shift things from one line to the wrong line. For example, if you had like a 2.99, that's below three, so it should go in the upper twos. It should not go in the lower threes. So you would put it as two and a nine. And then this note would let people know that it was 2.9 roughly, right? And the reason we leave off that extra nine is because it says here the leaf unit can only be one digit. So uh, hopefully it's kind of clear to you that's, that's messy, right? It's maybe not the best idea. So I would recommend that if you have to start making special notes on a stem and leaf diagram, you're probably better off doing a histogram or some other sort of graphical representation. But these sort of adjusted ones do get done, so watch out for notes and make sure you're interpreting the graphs correctly by reading those notes when they show up. And then one other thing is it says the stems can be more than one digit. So let's go back to what this data really represented, right? The number of students taking the final. Let's say that we had 114 students taking the final in a class, then we could add a leaf unit of like 11 and then put a four on the other side. That'd be 11 tens, which is 110 plus four, 114 students. If we were gonna do that though, we wouldn't put it right after four. We'd have to have five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, 10, 11, because you're not supposed to leave out classes that are empty in the middle. So those are some of the variations that you might see. Uh, let me just show you one other thing on the calculator that can be useful for these, and that's about sorting data. So I recommended earlier that if your data was out of order, that one way you could do it is a scratch work stem and leaf diagram like this before you went to the ordered one. But here's another option for you. If you go to your calculator and you press the stat button right here, and then edit should already be highlighted, so you can just press the enter key. It'll take you to uh, area where you can enter lists of numbers. A lot of times you'll have numbers in there already. If that's the case, like here, use the up arrow to highlight the list name, press clear, and then down arrow, and that'll empty those out. It takes those two steps, clear and down arrow. Don't use delete, because that gets rid of the column. And then we can just type these numbers in. Doesn't matter really whether you go down or across, it just matters that you get all the values in and press enter or down arrow after each one. I usually do enter. So let me just do that real quick. Hopefully I didn't make any typos, but I'm not going to worry about that too much here. I just want to show you this process. If you get all the data entered into the calculator like this, 
then you can press the stat button again and then instead of going to edit you can go to sort A which stands for sort A sending which is small to large if you press enter there that'll paste it to your home screen and then you want to tell it what list you were in so if we look at that list again it was list L1 so if I go back to there what I want to do is tell it L1 and if you look above the one key in blue it says L1 so if you want to get to that you hit the blue second key and then L1 the colors might be different on your calculator but whatever the second key is you'd want to press that to get it L1 and when you do that if you look up above that said we want to sort the list L1 and then I press enter it just says done but if I press stat and edit now the list is in order and if I have the list in order that could allow me to just jump down here and start going straight to work on this and uh, I happen to notice that I do that. I do have a typo, it looks like, but again, not a big deal. I just mainly wanted to show you the sorting process right there. So you can use that or not use that, but it's actually good practice with the calculator. We'll be doing a lot more with data and lists in chapter three. So if you get a little practice with it here in chapter two, that'll be to your advantage later on. And then you save the work of doing the scratch work one uh, and you just go straight to the ordered one when your data, your raw data comes to you out of order, which is pretty typical. All right, that wraps up section 2.3.